When I was here, I taught ninth grade biology, and I taught both honors biology for ninth graders and regular biology, which is the basic biology course that everybody in Indiana has to take in order to graduate from high school. So I uh, always enjoyed that. And then I also taught a course in genetics that I developed, my gosh, I think it was like 1986, an elective course, and loved teaching that. It was juniors and seniors, and it was an elective. And I loved it because it forced me to really keep up to date because the things going on in molecular genetics and medical genetics changes so rapidly and it's a challenge to keep up, but I just loved it. And then I also developed a science research projects course. I think that one started about 1997 and so I ran it up until I retired in 2020. And as far as I know, I think both courses are still going strong, genetics and the science research course. But uh, this was so gratifying. It was for juniors and seniors who were interested in taking it. And they would work in labs over at Purdue. They had release time, last period of the day, to go over to Purdue and work in a lab of their choice for the entire school year on a project. So I had to spend the summer before finding mentors at Purdue. Not easy. Would you like to take a high school student into your lab? That's kind of how the conversation went. Um, and I, I would find out what specific area of science or engineering or medicine the kids were interested in. And so then I would hook them up with a mentor so they could work in that person's lab. Last period and then into the whatever evening. And the neat thing about that course, it was so much fun because for two reasons. One, it launched a lot of careers. I had uh, over 300 kids working in Purdue labs over that time period. It launched a lot of careers and they taught me a lot. Uh, here's a young lady, for example, who did some uh, cancer research. She's finishing her PhD now in cancer research. Uh, this young lady was in uh, the animal sciences department doing an animal behavior study on ducks. Hmm. And uh, there was another one. Uh, this young man worked with salmonella bacteria <coughs> over in the biology department. So kids worked in veterinary medicine, biology, chemistry, engineering, botany, psychology, all over the place, whatever they were interested in. What was really fun for me is at the end of the school year, when they would present their projects to me, if it was in some area other than biology, my area, I had no idea what they were talking about. It's like, that was just kind of fun. So um, it taught me that if you have kids who are really interested and really capable, just point them in the right direction. That's, that's the key. So, I've had people ask me, Joe, you taught for 42 years? Are you crazy? How did you do that? What kept you going? You wanna know what kept me going? For me, it wasn't just a job, it was a calling. Now that may sound simplistic, but I loved it, despite the things that came up, the hassles, like problems with canvas, <laughs> like you were talking about, or, you know, little things that come up. I mean, that happens in any profession. Things just happen. You have to be flexible. Uh, things irritate you. Some kids can be annoying. Wait, is that right? <laughs> Nod your head yes if you agree with that. Yeah, some kids can be. Uh, things come up, but overall, I loved it. <coughs> I loved it. And I think that's the evidence that for me it was a calling. Plus, other things that kept me going, um, it gave me the opportunity to pursue my passion, which is biology. I was able to do biology every single day. Now, those of you who are not biologists, hang with me, okay? 
But you all have your things you're passionate about, I think. It might be helping those kids who are at risk. It might be doing biology. It might be trying to help kids learn how to write properly. Um, whatever your passion is, if you're teaching in an area that's in your passion area, I mean, that's a real blessing. That's a real blessing. So I was able to do biology every day, every single day. And you know what? There, you're not going to get super, super rich, right? Duh, we know that. But there are other opportunities. Like, for example, I got this grant from the Lilly Endowment several years ago to go to the Galapagos Islands and spend eight days sailing the Galapagos Islands with a naturalist guide following in the footsteps of Charles Darwin. I mean, there, there are opportunities if you keep your eyes open and ears open for grant possibilities. There, there are things you can do that will enrich you. Um, so I just loved it. I loved teaching biology. And, and I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed the, the challenge when a kid would come in on the first day of school, some ninth grader, and say, uh, I hate science and I've never been good at it. I just love that challenge. I made like a game for myself, you know? Did you have any kids say anything like that on your first day? Sort of. Yeah, I just viewed it as a kind of a fun challenge. Um, opportunity to be creative. I mean, you can be creative in other fields, other professions, but teaching is unique in that there are lots of opportunities to be creative. And I think creativity is a uniquely human, pleasurable, self-satisfying activity. And teaching gives you that opportunity. And you know, when I look back, different ways of, of expressing that creativity or being creative, you know, it might have been uh, dream, dreaming up new ways to teach certain lab activities in more non-traditional ways or lessons in non-traditional ways. Throw out the old, read the chapter and answer the questions at the end. Mm. The creativity sometimes manifested itself in, in my being able to invite guest speakers in, like from the 19th century, like Charles Darwin came in one day. Not easy resurrecting him from the dead. <laughs> uh, and uh, Gregor Mendel, the, the father of heredity, he came in. And, uh, so those were scary things to do, but it took me out of my comfort zone. And it was wild and crazy. I thought the kids would laugh me out of the room. But no. Oh my gosh, ninth graders, they were serious. They sat there. They started taking notes. I, I couldn't believe it. They treated Gregor Mendel, for example, better than they treated Mr. Rule. They did. They sort of played along and fell into the role-playing kind of thing, asked great questions, like, why did you decide to become a monk? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and biological questions as well. The other creative aspect that I really enjoyed was, uh, I'm kind of nerdy in this way. I don't know if that's the right word. Geeky. I got into developing self-paced computer tutorial lessons that would take the place of topics that I used to lecture on. Engage the kids more. They said they liked it. They really liked it. And that was enjoyable because that was a creative outlet. But I did have one little guy, a ninth grader, who was painfully honest with me. And he said, one day he said, Mr. Rule, I think I like your lectures better than the computer lessons. And I said, what? oh, really? Uh, what do you mean, why? And he said, well, 
in a lecture, you only kind of halfway have to pay attention. But when you're on a computer lesson, you got to totally pay attention. I thought, okay, well, thank you for that feedback. That's very helpful. Um, so anyway, when I when I created these lessons, they I would put in. I'm not a computer programmer, so anybody could do it, but. Um, I put in little checks for understanding periodically in the computer lessons. Prompts would come up on the screen, questions that they would have to write or type in the answers to. And, and then if they got it right, a video clip would pop up giving them positive feedback, you know, and they would be allowed to proceed on in the lesson. If they got it wrong, a video would pop up basically telling them, no, you got it wrong and it would loop them back to remediation work so that they couldn't continue on in the program until they answered correctly. That was kind of fun creating those. So let me just show you as an example of just fun being creative. What um, might happen if you answered a question correctly? Uh, yeah, baby. <laughs> you might get that kind of response. Or you might get this. Bingo. Or if you answered incorrectly, this might pop up on the screen. Something like this. Always with your work tonight, Do you know that I say? Sometimes the smart kids would try to miss them on purpose just to see what video clips would come up. <laughs> and here's another one that was kind of fun. What would you do with the brain if you had one? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you can kid with them and joke with them. It's all right. It's all good. Okay, um, oh, the other thing I noticed, kids keep you young. That's why when I'm in the presence of adults, I don't know how to act. Jackie Vega, if you are in the building, will you cool. please come to the guidance office? I Jackie fondly Vega, remember the these office. kinds of... Thank you. Yeah. Happens Random right. interruptions. Yeah, happens, mm -hmm. right? Um, kids keep... I really do think kids keep you young. I, I told... I've told uh, friends of mine other adult friends who are not educators that I, I really, despite all the issues that come up sometimes and the difficulties and the challenges, I thought I really have the best job in the world because I get to work with people who are fun and funny and energetic and creative and insightful. You know, they happen to be 14 to 18, but uh, I think they keep you young. And like I said, I, in the presence of adults, sometimes I don't know how to act, which is a problem. Can be a problem. Oh, no two work days are ever the same. I remember. No two days are ever the same. And um, I guess the realization that I was involved in something that was important. The work you're doing is so important. I'm kind of biased. I think what you're doing is like one of the most important professions on the planet. I really believe that with all my heart. Even on those days when I was like dead tired, <laughs> dragged myself into school. Okay, for example, maybe my wife and I were up all night with a sick toddler. Or in later years in my career, worried and concerned about and helping out with aging parents. There's always something. Or the furnace goes out. Okay, that morning before you go to school, furnace goes out, or the dog died, or you're catching a cold. Um, or you're just exhausted, bone tired. Even on those days, um, Walking into school, I remember thinking, I, this is really important. I can do this. So you're in the most important profession in the world. And I think thinking adults know this. Okay, thinking adults value what you do. Thinking adults, we've got to qualify that. Okay, I remember a time when I was um, standing in line at the grocery store, a long line, and 
the person in front of me and the person behind me, we just started chatting, just total strangers. And uh, the conversation eventually came around to what do you do for a living when you're not standing in line at the grocery store? And so uh, I think the lady in front of me was like a receptionist in some office at Purdue and the guy behind me was an insurance salesman or something like that. And so I told them what I did. And I kid you not, and this has happened more than once, they, um, I could sense in their voice and in their eyes um, deep respect for the work that we do. And I'd go so far as to say a sense of reverence. Other people, thinking adults, know that what you're doing is really important. Oh, by the way, time out. There's no test on this stuff. Okay, no test. And kids know it too. Like Peppermint Patty. Well, no, she doesn't know right now. Charlie Brown's gonna educate her. I wonder what teachers make a difference. So even, even kids, when they're honest, they value you. Society in general may not. Kids do when they're honest. Thinking adults do. So I guess those are some of the things that kind of kept me going. Um, and sometimes in education, there will be, I'll call them, I guess, extrinsic rewards. Extrinsic. And sometimes. This was like, this was 2017. I know that Debbie Beck retired last spring, but Bill Houston and Kevin Igo, they're still here. Okay, this was in the spring of, of 2017. And the reason I'm looking like very uncomfortable there is we had this big all school assembly program in the morning down in the gym. And it was a surprise announcement. These three people were in on it. <laughs> they were in on the secret. But it was a bit like big surprise. And in that assembly program, it was, it was announced that um, I was about to be inducted into the National Teachers Hall of Fame. Um, one of five pre-K through 12th grade teachers from across the country. That was pretty special. Um, and I was emotionally kind of, well, you know. So sometimes there are extrinsic rewards. Um, the fun part about that is they took the five of us teachers to Washington, D.C., to the White House. We got invited to the White House, um, went into the Oval Office. The president was sitting behind the Resolute desk in the Oval Office. And they whisked the five of us in there real quick. Security did. To stand beside the president's desk while the president sat there um, and get a picture taken, okay? That's what we did. And so I remember reaching down as he sat there and I shook his hand. That's kind of the thing you do when you're invited to the White House, right? But what was really cool was touching the Resolute desk, you know? I was like, oh man, this is so cool. The Resolute desk. This is amazing. So sometimes there's extrinsic rewards. Sometimes. So the kids ask me, that was, boy, that was a long time ago, 2012. <laughs> the kids asked me that last year, last year of teaching, Mr. Rule, why are you retiring? You like this, doing this stuff. So why'd you retire? And I said, well, there are several reasons. One, our grandkids are not going to stay little forever. And the two little grandsons live nine hours away in Searcy, Arkansas. The two granddaughters live four hours away just south of Lansing, Michigan. They're not going to stay little forever. That was one reason. The other reason is uh, my wife and I like to travel. At times, maybe other than spring break or Christmas vacation, this was so cool. I know what this place is. Amherst Fort. Pardon? 
I know what this place is. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's where the Holy Grail is kept. Yeah. Indiana Jones, my <laughs> <laughs> Uh Yeah, Petra in Jordan. Yeah. yeah, so travel, opportunities to travel. Oh, and for fun, uh, last summer I wrote a book. I wrote a book. It's good. You've read it? Yeah. No way. Yeah, I got it uh, when I graduated. It was a gift when I graduated from Purdue. Really? Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope it was okay. It was good. Okay. <laughs> well, I have. I brought a copy, and we're going to have a drawing at the end of class to give away a copy. So. And here's a shameless plug. <laughs> You can get the book if you want. (laughs) Shameless plug, okay, enough of that. Um, So let's see. Oh, shameless plug. So let's see. Now, I tell you what, when you get old and you retire, you start reflecting. And so I've been thinking about this question. What's the secret to true happiness and fulfillment in life? Uh, What do you think? What What are your ideas? What's the secret? Like if you could go up on a mountaintop to a guru and say, what's the secret to true happiness and fulfillment in life? What what do you think the answer would be? Check out the wait time. Being satisfied when you look back. Oh, okay. Feeling like maybe you changed things a little bit or you had an impact mm-hmm. on people good I like that um, society I think kind of gives us a subtle message that the real secret is another secret this is an idea of another secret is work real hard most of your life at a job that maybe you don't really like or that you don't find fulfilling so you can make lots of money so you can buy lots of stuff So you can spend most of your free time taking care of your stuff. And then someday you get old and you retire and you give away all your stuff. And that's the secret too. I don't think that's it. You know what I think the secret is? Relationships. With those that you love and those that you like and maybe even those that you don't like too much. Relationships with people. And the reason I think that is because remember at the beginning of 2020 what we went through? Masks, social distancing, shutdowns, which were essential. In my opinion. Essential. But it made us suffer. It hurt. I remember during that time watching commercials on TV of happy people in restaurants with people all around and happy people (laughs) at basketball games that were crowded. The stands were crowded and people were all around. I remember watching those commercials and people having a beach party and frolicking on the beach. And I remember thinking, man, I miss those days. Um, I think if that, if the pandemic taught us anything, it's that, we are a social species and we hurt we suffer when we don't have that i really believe that the isolation affected some people more than others and here's the reason i believed our brains are wired to be social we are a social species right we're social animals that's how we're made. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it. Okay, try to, let's try to imagine our prehistoric hominid ancestors out hunting for food, like this big food item here. What do you suppose happened to the ones who were more likely to try to take on a woolly mammoth by themselves? With a spear? or a bow and arrow, what what happened to them, (coughs) likely? They were exterminated. Probably, (laughs) yeah. 
probably weren't very successful. But those who knew how to work together, communicate, collaborate, had probably a better chance of surviving and reproducing and passing their genes on to the next generation and so on and so on. So that's how we're made. That's how we're made. And now I've been doing some reading lately, interesting scientific brain research that suggests that our brains are also wired for love. Being loved and loving. Um, and I don't mean like warm, fuzzy, mushy. That's not what I'm talking about. But our brains are wired for that. We need people. Now, okay, I have to be honest. There are times when I get frustrated. It's only normal. It's human. And I think, boy, I say to my wife, I'd love it. What, what, we ought to just go live on a mountaintop somewhere in the wilderness and off the grid. And because people can be, you know, people. <laughs> but people who try that, most people, after a while, they start hurting emotionally that physical contact, that social contact with other people. So <clears throat> that's how our brains are made. We're wired for loving and being loved or being accepted. So I think that has profound implications for education. So the secret to true happiness and fulfillment in life, I think it's this. I think that's it. Meaningful relationships with the people that you love. I know a guy who uh, retired from Purdue several years ago. He was a psychology professor. He's in his 90s now. He's retired, long retired. But he did some research where he interviewed hundreds of terminally ill patients, which kind of sounds, I don't know if I could do that, but that's what he did. And he said, just about every single one of them said they were less worried about themselves than they were about the loved ones that they were going to leave behind. And the second thing they all kind of agreed on was if they had to live life over again, they would worry less about climbing the professional ladder or spending all that extra time in the office, et cetera, et cetera. And they would, have, they would spend more time and energy focusing on the relationships that they have with the people that they love. So I think this is huge. So I'm going to ask another question, and I'll bet you're going to know the answer. So what's the secret to true happiness and fulfillment in the classroom? Relationships. Relationships. Establishing appropriate, meaningful relationships with your kids. In my early years, I would always spend the first day going over rules, regulations, policies, all that kind of stuff. And then one day I said to myself, self, they hear that in every class. Back then we were on a seven period day a long time ago. They hear that every, every class, first day of school, let's try something different. So I started out the first day with some kind of a get acquainted activity and I participated too. And in the book, I described that activity, but to me, that was so important to, to start early establishing those important relationships. Eventually you're going to see that sometimes substitute teachers will come in to the building. And not always, but a lot of times substitute teachers have major discipline problems. Especially if the kids don't know them. <coughs> so why do you suppose they have the problems that they have? With kids acting up and not doing what they're supposed to do. They don't have a relationship with them. They don't have a relationship with the kids. Right. That's, that's the key. I think relationship is huge. Now there is like several C's that I've sort of discovered by trial and error through the years of teaching. 
several C's that are important. The number one C I'm going to call caring. Everything I've read, every experience I've had tells me that the most powerful, effective motivator of kids is if they perceive that the teacher genuinely cares about them as individuals. That's the most powerful motivator. If you want to inspire kids, go beyond just teaching, you know? Maybe move into inspiring. If they perceive that the teacher genuinely cares about them, that seems to be the most effective motivator of all. Um, caring, AKA love. I'm not afraid to call it love. And you're gonna see why. These are other C's that I think are important to get kids involved with. And you probably learned about these in your methods courses in college. That's a whole nother actually workshop session. So we're not gonna go into detail on that. I just wanna focus on the caring for a minute or two or three. Number one C, caring. Now, these are not my original ideas. Are you guys too young to know about Mr. Rogers? No. Was he on TV when you were kids? He's still on TV. He's still on TV? PBS or Netflix? Yeah. He had it going on. Now, when I was a kid, when I was in high school, when I was in high school and my younger siblings were watching him, I just thought he was weird. Because I was in high school, okay? Then when I eventually had kids, and I would watch them watch Mr. Rogers, and I'd sit down and watch with them, then I remember thinking, this, this guy's good. He's good. He would look right in the camera, and the kids sitting in front of the TV, I, I know they just felt like he was talking to them. And it wasn't fast paced. It was, uh, I, I've got my two little grandsons. I introduced them to Mr. Rogers once. We found them on Netflix reruns. I think it was Netflix. And they were so used to watching things like Paw Patrol and other things that move fast, okay? And <clears throat> it was amazing. It was like magic. They sat there for the entire time and entranced, totally tuned in. It was just like he was talking to them. Um, that's why I say he was, he was really good. He knew what he was doing. And this book is a good read if you're an educator. He, the things that he did for three-year-olds, the basic concepts can be applied to kids of all age levels, I think. This is what he said. I love this quote. Good teaching must address the social and emotional needs, not just the cognitive. Do you all ever hear about social and emotional learning? Okay. He said this a long time ago. Social and emotional needs. Once you meet those needs, then the cognitive is going to follow. So it goes on. If we meet the social and emotional needs, then the cognitive will follow. Now, I tried this. It works. Even with my juniors and seniors in the genetics course, if they felt welcome, like I was glad they were there. I haven't told them at the beginning of the school year, thank you for taking my class. If they felt welcome and included, inclusiveness, that's, that's huge. That's so important. If they felt welcome and included, if we met their social needs, and if they perceive that the teacher genuinely cares about them as individuals, you meet their emotional needs, then all kinds of cognitive stuff can come through. Does this stuff make sense? I mean, um, sometimes I feel like, well, gosh, this isn't rocket science. And, but I don't know if it's emphasized. Will you tell me, is this kind of stuff emphasized at all in a, in like those college teacher preparation courses? Maybe, I hope so. The importance of caring. Now, you know, sometimes people get nervous when I start talking about the importance of loving your students. 
I think it sounds kind of creepy or mushy, but it doesn't have to be so. Anybody know who this is? Who this was? There's an author named C.S. Lewis. Okay, famous 20th century author, C.S. Lewis. And one of the books he wrote was entitled The Four Loves. And in this book, he talks about how the ancient Greeks had, their language was a whole lot more sophisticated or precise than ours today. And they had like four different words that all translate into our English word love, L-O-V-E. Four different words, four different <coughs> kinds of loves. But they all translate into L-O-V-E in English. One of the kinds of love that he mentions in the book is the Greek word storge, which basically that kind of love just means liking a lot. And it could be like the love I have for pancakes. When I say I love pancakes, that would be the Greek word I'm using, okay? It can also refer to the love that you have for family members, those who you share lots of genes with. Um, second kind of love he talked about, philia. Basically, friendship love. Love you have for your friends. Oh, I just love my next door neighbor. You know, that's a different kind of love. And he talked about this Greek word, eros, which is erotic love. A lot of times if you mention the word love to some like 15, 16, 17 year olds, that's the first thing that comes to their mind, but not always. Erotic love. But the fourth kind of love he mentioned in the book and talked about is this word agape, which is the highest form of love. In extreme cases, it can even be self-sacrificial. This is the kind of love that motivates, for example, I remember, I remember seeing it in an elderly man and his wife who had Alzheimer's and he took care of her up until the day she died. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. See, that's agape love. I remember reading stories in um, accounts of um, World War II where the Marines were fighting in the South Pacific and there are several cases, I thought it was just in the movies, several cases where a Marine would, would throw himself on a live hand grenade to save the lives of his buddies. That That's agape love. It's, Self-sacrificial, it's, it's a intentionally caring about the well-being of the other, whatever's best for the other. It, it's the highest form, it's, it's not emotional, it's decisional. And I think that's the kind of love we can have towards our kids, our students, that kind. Because it's not emotional. It's decisional, and if the kids perceive that in you, they're going to respond. Now, will this prevent all discipline problems? No, but most, if they perceive that the teacher genuinely cares. And I think it's nice, it's handy that this is not a warm, fuzzy kind of love. It's decisional, because let's face it, some kids are hard to like. They can be annoying. All right, I was looking at a YouTube video by a teacher named Azul Taronis, and he interviewed 26,000 high school students spread out over like eight different schools. And he asked them, um, this is what he asked the kids, what makes a good teacher great? That was the question, 26,000 students. And they all came up with these great answers. Uh, the two big ones were, number one, the teacher is passionate about the subject. Sometimes you have to act, right? I remember sometimes in the late afternoon, late afternoon, last period on a Friday, before vacation, maybe, I had to act like meiosis was the most exciting thing. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to be an actor. Love the challenge, though. And number two, the teacher loves the students. Now, most of the kids said, the teacher likes us a lot. 
That's what they said. And sometimes you may even have to stretch to do that. Use that agape love. So, I want to get practical here. So how can we show kids that we care? Can I just share with you things that I discovered by trying things over 42 years? You guys probably are so much better prepared. I know you're so much better prepared than I was when I was a first year teacher. Um, they just know what's going on now more in the world of education. So these are some things that I just kind of discovered and tried and by golly, they work. Uh, number one, stand by the door and greet the students by name when they arrive. That's kind of hard to do, especially if you have to move from classroom to classroom. Anybody have to do that? Move around? That's kind of hard to do, but whenever you can, that's important. Number two, be real and smile on the first day of school. I really believe that that's important. In other, in other words, be a person. Has anybody ever told you, maybe they don't tell you this anymore, don't smile until Thanksgiving? I think that's so unnatural. It's, well, in my case, it just wasn't me. I, I couldn't. I remember when I was a first year teacher, first day of school, Macon, Georgia, first day of school. I'm in the teacher's lounge at lunchtime. I've been sweating, stressed. It's like, oh gosh, did I pick the right profession? And an old codger, I mean an old veteran, sat down at the table with me and said, let me give you some advice. He even said, son, let me give you, don't smile until Christmas. <laughs> and it just didn't sound right. I still don't think it sounds right. I think a smile is a universal expression of acceptance. I think it is. See, you're smiling. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in other words, this doesn't really work. <laughs> oh, that was lunch supervision. Anybody in here have lunch supervision? Study hall? Ah, uh, okay. <coughs> yeah, that, that's not going to cut it. That's not going to do it. Uh, number three, learn the students' names as soon as possible and remember and use them inside and outside of the class. Learn something about their interests outside of class. First day of school, I always had them write that kind of stuff down. Actually, I had them pair up and interview each other and they had to write down certain bits of information. And then I would collect those and study those intensely. Learn those names within the first couple days. You've got homework in the first couple days, right? Learn those names. There's power in using somebody's name. They like to hear their name. Have a sense of humor. You've been told this. Raise your hand if you've been told this. Yeah, kids are fun. They they appreciate somebody with a sense of humor. Now, you gotta find your own style. Mine tended to be kind of the, I guess, the self-deprecating kind of humor. I could never tell jokes, so that's what I had to do. Number five, look prepared and be prepared. Over prepare. If you come in, <laughs> I remember when I was in school, I had teachers like this that come in and go, well, let's see, where's, where's my, where's my teacher's edition yeah. disaster. When you go into a restaurant, I mean, okay, there's a difference. When you go into a, a nice restaurant, Fancy, nice, expensive. May may have white tablecloths, place settings, very neat, flowers on the table. The food's all prepared. It's like you know that they knew you were coming. Okay, it makes a big difference. That's a professional way to be, right? As opposed to 
Now this may say some, this may say a lot about me, but as opposed to like pulling in late at night on a long trip into a fast food drive through restaurant and you order to keep yourself awake, maybe a cup of coffee and a chocolate shake. And they say, sorry, our ice cream machine is broken down. It's a different feeling than if you go into a nice restaurant, white tablecloth, right? Being prepared, that's just the professional thing to do. And kids, actually, they may not <coughs> express it, but they, pre they, uh, they appreciate it when you are that way. Be passionate, excited about what you're teaching. Might have to fake it until you make it. Anybody know who that is? Her name's Margaret McFarland. She was Mr. Rogers' mentor. And this is what she said. Attitudes aren't taught, they're caught. If a teacher has an attitude of enthusiasm, the student catches that, whether the student's in second grade or graduate school. I, I remember some college courses I took, and yeah, that's true. Even statistics was palatable because the instructor was very enthusiastic and used pop culture references and real life examples and stuff. Now what about, okay, now there are gonna be days when you don't feel like bringing it. Okay, how many days have you guys been in school so far? As a week? No. Nine days. Nine days. Nine days of active teaching. What? Ten days of active teaching. Ten days of active teaching. Have you had any days so far where you, you, you got up and you came and you just didn't feel like you, like, I don't know if I can bring it today. That's normal. Well, maybe you haven't. You guys are young and enthusiastic and eager and energetic. Not like these old worn out, grizzled old veterans like me. Um, well, I discovered that if you fake it, eventually you start to make it. Um, I remember times like late afternoon, like I was, okay, let's talk about, okay, um, graphing. It's late in the afternoon. And just don't feel like it. Just don't feel like bringing it. But you got to remember, you know, those kids in the afternoon, they deserve just as much as first hour kids. So you're, you're going over how to make these graphs or something. Um, I discovered that if I didn't really feel like it, a cold coming on or just tired or whatever, if I acted like it was the most exciting thing, then if I, if I acted that way, then pretty soon the kids would pick up on that. And they would start to take an interest. And that would motivate me even more. Ramp me up a little bit more, which would ramp them up a little bit more. It's kind of a positive feedback thing. And I always thought, it's interesting how that works. And then I learned in a workshop why that works. The best workshop I ever went to was presented by this guy named uh, Dave Burgess. And he has this great book, Teach Like a Pirate. Anybody familiar with this? This is a must read. This is a must read. And in this book, he says, even if you're only acting at first, an amazing thing happens along the way. You actually start to really feel and become enthusiastic because of your breath pattern and the way you're holding and moving your body. And the idea is uh, physiology works fast. That's why acting works. That's why it works. And I remember when I was sitting in that workshop, I remember thinking, well, I've tried that and it works. And so the neat thing about that experience in that workshop I attended was I was affirmed in something that I already thought was important. So sometimes when you go to professional development, you're going to learn new things. It helps make you better. And sometimes you're simply going to be affirmed in something that you already do. And, and that's a good thing too. That's a good thing too. And by the way, professional development meetings, have you guys had any besides this one? Not really yet. Like whole faculty or anything? Not really, no. 
Sometimes people will say, Mr. Rule, can you give us some advice? My advice would be don't sit in the back with the paper graders and the gripers. That may sound cold and judgmental. I didn't mean for it to come off like that. Um, because, well, negative company can, can bring you down. You want to be with positive people. So fake it until you make it. Seven, a lot of time for freedom of movement, hands-on work. They like it. I remember kids telling me in private, Mr. Rule, I love biology. And I'd say, why? I was thinking maybe it's all about DNA and stuff. No. Why? Because we get to do stuff in here. They're high energy. A lot of time for project work. Remember, creativity. A uniquely human, pleasurable, self-satisfying activity. Uh, I remember this on this was like 35 years ago. See the tape tore the some of the ink off of the photograph. 35 years ago. And then I ran into her like 35 years later, and she remembered all the parts of the cell and their functions. And floored me. And I think that's because of this. Do you know about this? Have you seen this? I'm going to put this PowerPoint on my website in case anybody wants to look at it again. Kids remember, or they retain 10% of what they read, 20% of what they hear. Raise your hand if you've seen this before. 30% of what they see, 50% of what they see and hear, 70% of what they discuss with others. 80% of what they experience and 95% of what they teach to others based on the work of William Glasser. She had to not only, she not only made that cell model of a cake with all the edible parts, but she had to teach about it when she came in the next day. Whatever possible allow for student choice of learning activities, that's a whole nother workshop topic. Kids like having choices. Uh, this was my biology class shortly before I retired. Now, it's a lot of work to set up choices of activities that no matter what the kids choose, they're still going to achieve the required objectives. There's a lot of work involved in that, but it pays off. It's not something you can pull off in the first year. You have to accumulate lots of ideas and files of teaching activities and lesson plans over the years. Recognize kids for their accomplishments outside of the classroom. Have any of you done this or thought about doing this? Whenever the kids make the newspaper? For something good that they've done. Okay, not the police beat. <laughs> I, I used to do this whenever kids made the newspaper. I put their article up and I would always tell them, I want you to sign it and they really got into that. They loved it. It was, they really, this made a big difference in a lot of cases. I told them to sign it because then someday when you're rich and famous, um, your autograph might help fund my retirement. And that makes it, that's a simple little gesture and it makes a big difference. It's worth subscribing to the newspaper, the printed version, just to do that. Recognize birthdays, praise students in public, but never yell. Um, not a, a, a wise elementary teacher told me once, don't yell. If you yell, then you've lost. Say hi when you see them, wherever you see them, in the hall, in the mall, you know. Oh, this is a big one. Now, you can't attend everything, but try to pick a few now and then. It's kind of hard to do, but it's so important. When the kids see you there, they really appreciate it. I'll never forget the softball game. I could overhear voices in the dugout. Mr. Rule came to our game. So it makes a big difference. Shows kids that you care. So remember, our brains are wired for love. Sorry. That's all right. Kids appreciate it when you show that you care. Now I was thinking about this. This is the last, this is the end.
What kinds of careers are going to give you the most job satisfaction overall? All jobs, all careers have headaches and stuff you have to do that you don't like to do. Every profession. But if you can find one that allows you to love, give, cultivate human relationships, and be creative, you're going to find fulfillment in that. So I'd say you're in the right place. You're in the right profession. That's all I wanted to talk about. I appreciate you guys, your attention. This is like the most well-behaved class I've ever had in my life. <laughs> this is the best. This is the best. Um, the important thing to be reminded of you guys is that what you do is vital. It's critical. So. Thank you for letting me share. I appreciate it.